So the the experiment that you're working on with Dr. Cannon, you're going to be giving these modified stem cells um, to people who have uh, HIV and lymphoma, correct? That's right. And so when you talk about the process of, of conditioning and getting people ready to accept the stem cells, what are we really looking at in terms of the, the, that, the health risks that they may be taking in this study? Right. Okay, so we're using AIDS lymphoma for one reason, and that is that it is a, a model system already that is ethical, mm -hmm. in which we, to, you can alter the bone marrow mm -hmm. uh, and give it back to an AIDS patient. You couldn't do that to a healthy AIDS patient because the process of bone marrow transplantation is risky. Mm -hmm. it's, we call it the, the um, procedure-related risks, mm -hmm. and, and they are all well-defined, and they're used only in patients who are basically going to die of their uh, leukemia or their mm -hmm. lymphoma. And therefore, you can justify it. Mm -hmm. We cannot justify that right now in, in healthy HIV positives. Mm -hmm. But having said that, there are less, there are more gentle ways mm -hmm. to make uh, space, we call it, or, or conditioning the bone marrow so that it will receive the, um, the new bone marrow. Mm -hmm. The reason we do it with the leukemics, because we had to kill the leukemia. Mm -hmm. And so why not just kill two birds with one stone? You kill the leukemia and you set up the marrow so it's empty and now you can just fill it with the new marrow. Mm -hmm. Taking it to the HIV positive person, you don't want to do one of those things. You don't want to kill any extra cells that you you don't need to kill. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to just do the minimum amount of, of manipulation. Uh, and so that's why we think there are safer ways to do that. We just don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. There's several that have, are being tested right now. Mm -hmm. I mentioned busulfan uh, mm -hmm. earlier. And that's a relatively uh, easy drug to take. It's an oral drug. You can measure the doses and it's quite safe. Mm -hmm. um, it could have some side effects, but it's probably justifiable. And it's already been used and shown to be successful in getting gene therapy into uh, one's own stem cells, putting them back in, getting engraftment, and actually curing the disease. In this case, it was thalassemia. But if you can cure thalassemia, why can't you cure HIV? Who would you say are the biggest naysayers, the biggest skeptics, the ones that are holding this back? The I would most? say the, well, the NIH, of course, uh, uh, the, the Division of AIDS has never uh, been behind this in a big way. I think for the first time they are now um, uh, beginning to fund these kind of studies. Mm -hmm. um, and the other naysayers are those who are satisfied with the current uh, therapies, mm -hmm. and that includes physicians, mm -hmm. and uh, physicians who are comfortable with the ability to treat HIV with with uh, uh, pills mm -hmm. uh, are, are satisfied because they, they do so well. I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it, the, the heart therapy is very good right mm -hmm. now. The only issue is, do I have to take it for the rest of my life, and what does that do to my long-term life expectancy? People are probably not completely healthy mm -hmm. when they're on chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And if you can get rid of that, why not? Yeah. Well, that's the whole question. Can you can we actually d develop a safe way to do that? And we don't know yet. I don't really think of it as cure-related research. I think of it in terms of there's some really exciting new ways of thinking about treating people for any sort of disease out there right now. Stem cell therapy and gene therapy. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to marry the two together, do a sort of a gene therapy on patient stem cells, and see if that can be used to treat HIV. And I think for me, part of the reason I started thinking about this is, although HIV is a virus and it's an infectious disease, I think it's more helpful to think about it almost as if it's a genetic disease once you have it. You know, this virus gets into your body, it integrates into your you know, DNA, it becomes part of your cells, and you're kind of stuck with it for life. So that sounds like a genetic disease to me. So I think the way to think about treating it is the way that we think about treating some genetic diseases, mm -hmm. which is about, you know, can we fight a genetic disease mm -hmm. with genetic tools? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's been kind of a labor of love for the past, you know, 20 years probably I've been working on HIV. Um, and been thinking about how I could use gene therapy um, to sort of fight the virus. So I'm kind of excited that, you know, the rest of the world is sort of caught up to yeah. Um, you know, how kind of cool this could be. Mm -hmm. We've got a long ways to go, but researchers always say that, don't they? I think I'm convinced it will work. Mm -hmm. what, I, um, what I'm not sure about is the length of time it will take to, you know, go through the steps that we have mm -hmm. to do just to be 
ethical and correct uh, researchers and clinicians, you know, what we're proposing to do hasn't been done in people before. Mm -hmm. And when you're kind of like the first ones to do something, you've always got to go a little bit slower, a little bit more cautiously. I know that can be kind of frustrating to some people, but, you know, um, if you, you know, people with HIV disease or HIV infection are not dropping dead like mm -hmm. they were 20 years ago. So I don't want to rush into anything. I want to make sure that first of all, we do no harm, we don't make things worse. But I'm kind of, you know, cautiously optimistic that actually this is, this is going to work, you know? I really am. I don't think that many people with AIDS or people with other life-threatening diseases realize that the NIH does not have enough money to properly do research um, on major diseases anymore, including AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, they have been flat funded, so basically they've had about the same amount of money every year since 2003, even while inflation, um, biomedical inflation it's called, has like upticked. And so they have a lot less money than they used to, and it's really hurting research. Um, and I see that as a bipartisan issue. Um, the last big effort to fund the NIH was actually a combination of Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich, who just happened to really be a fan of medical research and science and understand what, you know, what it meant. Um, and together, um, they doubled the budget of the NIH, but then that stopped in 2003. That's what we need to do. We need to hugely increase the budget um, at the NIH, and we need to allocate much, much more money to AIDS cure research. Um, AIDS cure research right now is only getting 3% of the AIDS research budget at the NIH. It needs to be so much more. Uh, right now it's between 40 and 60 million dollars. Um, and the AIDS Policy Project has just launched a letter writing campaign to Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, calling for $240 million a year because we're getting closer to a cure. We need to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the work that you guys have been doing for the last year, mm -hmm. you know, producing your report, mm -hmm. um, you know, raising public awareness, do you feel, do you feel yourselves getting traction? Is, yeah. is, this, is, this, is it going somewhere? You know, it's... It's really exciting to work on this campaign, and we, we really need, um, especially people with AIDS, to join us to write letters to Francis Collins. You can go to our website at www.aidspolicyproject.org and you know download some talking points and, and read more about the subject. But I would say our progress has been measured in just sort of weird little moments, like when I saw that one of the top researchers in the country had joined our Facebook page, I actually cried. <laughs> um, and when I, you know, one of the leading AIDS doctors in San Francisco got up at 6.30 in the morning to meet with us really, really early in this campaign, and he immediately got what we were doing, and now he's on our board, that was a really important moment. When Larry Kramer signed on to support us, uh, when he gave us money, that meant so much to us. Um, and when we see how much more talked about a cure is, how many more meetings they are, you know, how much more movement there is, the fact that PAUSE put the cure campaign, put the cure for AIDS on its cover, it's, it's really, you can feel it and it's really exciting to work on. <laughs>